seated. Thank you, Matt. Be opening your Bibles this morning to the New Testament book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to begin immediately reading from verse 12. Listen to what God is saying here. The Apostle Paul, as God directs him, in the middle of that verse, he begins by saying this, I am not ashamed. He's been persecuted, he's been put in prison, all for the cause of Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of that. You tell us earlier in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's why he's suffering. But he says, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. I know whom I have believed. I believe God. I believe everything God says. I know whom I have believed. I have believed and, and I'm convinced, I'm fully persuaded that He's able to guard what I've committed to Him, what I've entrusted to Him. Ultimately, we're talking about our souls, our life. Of course, while we live, we are laying up treasures in heaven, and none of those good deeds that we have done will ever be forgotten by God. But ultimately, we're talking about our relationship with God and our eternal soul. We have entrusted our souls into the hands of Jesus, into the hands of our Heavenly Father. And he says, I'm, I'm convinced that He is able. He's able to keep what I've entrusted to Him until that day. I want you to go back with me this morning to the Old Testament. I want, we're going to go back into the time of Abraham. In our Sunday morning Bible class in the auditorium, we've been studying about the descendants of Abraham. And listen to what Job said. We've referred to this a few times over the years. In Job chapter 19, I want you to listen to what he says. He was a, a contemporary. Which side of Abraham? I don't know what, what side he was on. But, but he lived back in the days of the patriarchs before the time of Moses. And listen to what he says, beginning in, in verse 25, of the book of Job, chapter 19. He says, For as me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that the last he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see my God. Whom I, shall, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another, my heart faints within me. He says, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. And even though I have died and, and my flesh is gone from my body, I know that I will see my Redeemer with these eyes. With these eyes. And that I will be the one that's seeing him, not somebody else that's seeing him and telling me about it. He said, this is all too marvelous for me. I go back to our New Testament, let's, and let's go to the, the Gospel of John, and listen to what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, right down at the end of the chapter, in verse 56. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and... He saw it and was glad. He saw it and was glad. Go with me to Galatians, the book of Galatians in our New Testament. And then we're going to start putting these verses together. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9. He said, The Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are, of, who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So what is God saying? 2,000 years before Jesus came. Now we're on the other side, about 2,000 years removed. And so if, if, you're, if you're looking in, in, in the mirror reflection as we look back to Jesus, and as they stand and look forward to Jesus, we're, we're about the same point in, in time, about... 2,000 years removed from Jesus coming and living in the flesh and dying on the cross. We have the entirety of God's Word. 
we can read from the creation to the judgment. And we see it all. They didn't. They didn't have that. How is it that, that someone 2,000 years before Jesus came could say, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that even though I have died and been put in the grave and my skin is gone, I know that with these eyes I'm going to see my Redeemer. Not somebody else. He's, how, 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 can, how can Job be talking about Jesus Christ, and how could Job be talking about the resurrection of the bodily resurrection of the dead? All who are in the grave will, will come out of, of the grave because God told him about it. Well, he didn't have the complete story, and, and God, God will explain that to us when, when we read from what Peter has to say. And, and Peter's going to tell us that the prophets said a lot about Jesus. And they spent a lot of their time not only speaking on God's behalf and, and revealing things to people about what, what God had planned, but they also spent a lot of time trying to put it together. And say, so now, now how is this, how is this going to happen? We, we know that, it, that Emmanuel is coming, Emmanuel being God with us. We know that he's going to be born in, in, in Bethlehem. We know that he's going to be the tribe of, from the tribe of Judah. And, 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 and we know that one is going to come before him to prepare his way, to make straight his paths. And, and, and he's, he, in essence, he's going to be tearing down the mountaintops and filling in the valleys and, and making a level field for Jesus to work on. Now, we, we know that, that the church is going to begin in the city of Jerusalem. And we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We, but we don't know how it all fits together. Now, now we, we have all of these pieces. In fact, God will go on to say through Peter that, that even the angels, even the angels are, are wanting to look over like, like you're, you're standing in a room and, and, and here's the, the Heavenly Father and, and the Holy Spirit and here's Jesus and, and, and they're, looking, they're looking at this strategic map of, of the salvation of man and, and they're, they're huddled over this and, and they're looking at, at all the things that are going to be happening that will lead up to the coming of Jesus and then what's going to happen after he dies and returns to heaven and the church comes and all this time that we're living now waiting for the resurrection of the dead. And here they are looking at that and the angels are over here and they're on their tiptoes trying to peek over a shoulder and, and get a little better glimpse of, of, of what all is happening. And, and the angels didn't even understand all of it. They knew there's a lot of parts, there's a lot of pieces, but they don't understand it all. So they're kind of in the same boat that the prophets are. The prophets are revealing what God is going to do through Jesus, but they don't know how it all fits. And they don't know exactly when. They know that it's going to be in the time of the Roman Empire, but they don't know when in the time of the Roman Empire. But so so how, how, did, how did Job know that? How, how was Abraham able? Listen to what Jesus said. He said, Abraham rejoiced in seeing my day, and he did see it. How, how, how can that be? And how can it be that, that, that God talked to Abraham and, 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 and was explaining, evidently from what Galatians chapter 3 says, Whenever God blessed Abraham, you remember the blessings that God gave Abraham when he calls him first out of Ur of the Chaldees and said, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you the father of, 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 of nations. I, I'm, I'm going to bless you, and I'll bless those that bless you, and I'm going to curse those that curse you. And, 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 and through your seed, all nations of the world will be blessed. Not just the Hebrew nation that, that you're going to be the, the patriarch of, that I'm beginning with you, Abraham, and, and from there, we're, they're, they're going to be known as the Hebrew people or the Jewish people. But he says, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. And evidently, from what Galatians says, God explained that to Abraham. He preached the gospel to Abraham. He tells Abraham about what's going to happen, that, that Jesus is going to die and that he's going to be raised and he's going to, he's going to ascend in, into heaven. And, and that is, that's going to be our salvation. 
The Scripture tells us what Abraham, in Galatians 3 and verse 8, the Scripture tells us that the Gospel was preached to Abraham 2,000 years before it all happened. Did Abraham understand all of it? No. Did Job understand all of it? No. But they knew it was coming. And that's why the people in Jesus' day, they kept asking people. In fact, John preparing the way for Jesus. One of of the questions in John chapter 1 is they say, Are you the Christ? Are you the Christ? Are you the one that's coming? Or should we look for somebody else? And John says, I'm not not Jesus. I'm simply preparing the way for Jesus. They knew this was coming, but but they didn't know all of how it fit together. Just like we know heaven's coming. We we know the end of of life is coming. We we know the the day of resurrection is coming. When all who are in the grave will hear His voice and they will come out of the grave, the the righteous to everlasting life and and, and those who are unrighteous to be condemned. We we know that's going to happen. What that's going to look like and how it all is going going to actually be, I don't know and you don't either. Because the Bible doesn't tell us about that. He said, we're going to be, if you're still alive when Jesus comes back, you're going to be caught up together with, with all of the resurrected believers from all time. From all time. They're, they're, the, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then those who are alive and, and are remaining, they're going to be caught up together with them in, 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 the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I don't know what that's going to be like. I, I've never flown. Anytime my body has defied gravity, I've fallen. I I don't float. I I don't fly. But I I have no idea what that's going to be like. I don't know what it's going to feel like to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I don't know what that's going to feel like. But I do believe it's going to happen. And I believe it's going to happen because God tells me about it. And that's exactly what God is saying with regard to, to Abraham and to Job. Go to Hebrews chapter 13, in, in, or, or chapter 11 and verse 13, and listen to what God says about all of these men and women, about this great cloud of witnesses. Listen to what God says. All them died in faith. Mark that down first. All these died in faith, receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the land. They saw by faith what's coming. They believed by faith what was coming. Who did they believe? They believed God. They believed God. And and, and don't don't miss that. Just like we today, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we walk by, let me hear it church, faith, not by sight. And so we, we, we see, we see by faith. And, and faith, and, and, and this is a big part of it. This, this is a big part of it. Faith is being able to see what God is talking about that's coming. And we trust God so completely that we're not worried about the little details. We're not worried about, well, I look just like I look now whenever I get to heaven. God says we'll know as we're known. That ought to be enough. A- am I going to be tall or short or, or muscular or, or look wimpy? What, what is it all going to be like? We have no idea because God hasn't told us. But I know that I'll be there. I know that I'll be with Him. And and none of the rest really makes all that much difference. I've listened to to people as as they tried to explain how big heaven was going to be. Because it talks about heaven being four square. And, and, it, and it uses some, some symbolic language of, of all the dimensions of heaven. And it's like there's this giant cube up there. And, and so they're wondering, how, how are we going to put everybody in, in, that, in that space? I've listened as people have wrestled with the idea whenever Jesus said, you've been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many. Well, we kind of like that idea. I mean, to, to, to be a ruler, we, we like that idea. That God has made us kings and priests in His kingdom. And, and we like that idea. How that's going to play out, I don't have an idea in my mind about it. But I do know that it's going to happen. And I know that by faith. Because through faith, God helps me to see what's coming, even though I don't know all of the details. And I know that what I commit to Him is safe. 
I know that it's safe. A big part of our faith is being able to see. The apostles come to Jesus in Luke chapter 17 and verse 5. Now Jesus has just been talking about two very powerful thoughts, two very powerful problems in life. And, and, and the first one is, is causing someone to stumble. And he's talking specifically in Luke 17 and verse 1 and, and 2, he's talking about causing children to stumble. And he says, offenses must come, but, but woe to the person by whom they come. And if you cause a child to stumble, it would be better, it would be better that you tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the sea than to cause a little one to stumble. God takes that very seriously. And then he talks about forgiving your brother. If your brother sins against you. And we're not talking about, well, that was your idea and not my idea. We're, we're not talking about imagined offenses. We're not talking about accidental offenses. We're talking about a brother who sins against you. He's done something wrong. And you feel it. If your brother sins against you and he turns to you and asks for your forgiveness, you forgive him. If he sins against you seven times, even in one day, and seven times he turns to you and he says, I'm sorry, you forgive him. These are two big, big things. And so I'm not surprised that the apostles asked the question they ask in Luke chapter 17 and verse 5. Whenever they, they simply say to the Lord, they say, Lord, increase our faith. Said you just told us some, some pretty big things that we need to be doing that, that people do not have a tendency to do. We don't often think about the consequences of our own actions. We often don't think about all the little children that, that, that are, are watching us and, and, and hanging on every word that we say. We often don't think about the consequences of not forgiving your brother. But they're real. And as that soaks in, the apostles say, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus gives them instructions that don't seem to fit unless you're listening. The first thing he says, if you had mustard seed faith, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed that if I held a piece on my thumb from the back, you couldn't see it. You'd have to accept by faith that I had a mustard seed on my thumb. It's such a tiny thing. He said, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this tree right over there, and here's a mulberry tree that's right over there, you can say to that tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. Number one, he says, it doesn't take a lot of faith to do what God wants you to do. The apostles are saying, Lord, increase our faith. And what he's saying to them, you have enough faith. Oh, you need to have more. You need to have more. And they're, they're going to be very frustrating like we, we must be to our Lord. Because there's many times that Jesus is going to say, Oh, you have little faith. Haven't you been listening to me? Haven't you been listening to me? That, so that's the first thing he says to them. After they say, Lord, increase our faith. He says, you have faith. And, and, and the second thing that, that he talks about is the relationship between a servant and his owner or a servant and his master. And he says, now you stop and think with me. And everybody, everybody could understand th this example, especially in Jesus' day. He said, if, if a man has a servant and the servant's working out in the field, what, whatever his responsibilities were, and at the end of the day, that servant finishes his work and he comes back to his master's house and he comes in, he said, is that servant going to sit down and look at his master and say, fix me something to eat? I've been out in the sun all day. I've worked really hard all day. Now, would you fix me something to eat? He says, no, that's not what's going to happen. And you know it's not going to be what happens. The first thing that servant does whenever he comes back in, he washes his face and hands, and he goes in and he fixes dinner for his master. And then after his master has eaten, then he will sit down and eat. And then he says, he said, so you need to be careful. You need to be careful. The, what is in your heart, what is in your heart should be humility. That you're able to be part of your master's household. Because when we have done everything that God has commanded us to do, we still need to say we're unprofitable servants because we've only done what God wants us to do. And so the apostles say, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus, in essence, is, is saying, it's really not the size of your faith, it's what you do with it. 
It's what you do with it. Faith isn't a credit card that you put in your billfold and then when you need it, you take it out and you use it. It, 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 it it's, it's not an ATM card that, that will let you draw on whatever's in there. It's, it's not just something that you, you, you carry around. It's something that you are. And, and Jesus is saying, it's, it's really not the size of your faith. Yes, our faith needs to increase, and it, and it will. If we are listening to what God is saying, because he's saying it's, it's not how much you have, it's what you do with how much you have. And the way Jesus applies that and how we, we arrive at, at, at this thought is he connects faith to obedience. He connects faith to humility. He connects faith to forgiveness. He connects faith to, to whether I'm, I'm causing a child to stumble or not, whether I'm guarding my steps and being very careful to know that other people are watching. He connects faith to obedience. In fact, we're going to see that very specifically if, if you'll go with me. Because faith is a choice that you make. Faith is a choice that you make. It's not something that happens to you. And it's not something that God just gives to you. It's a choice that you make. And that's why Paul was able to say in first, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, I know. I know whom I believe. That's, that's why Job was, was able to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's why Abraham was, was able to say, I believe God. Because they made a choice. But go with me, if you will, to John chapter 3, verse 16. Beginning of verse 16. We, we know this. We, we've heard this so many times, but we're going to read down through verse 18. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes, that's the key word this month, is belief, faith. The Lord allowing time to continue, we're going to, next Sunday we're going to start talking about repentance. Repentance. And then we're going to talk about confession. For six weeks, the last six weeks of the year, we talked about baptism last November and December. Listen to what he says. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now don't leave chapter 3. Go to the end of the chapter with me. Verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Sounds like what we just read. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son, he shifted gears, didn't he? You hearing what he says? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God will abide in him. Do you, do you see how God connects belief and obedience? That's not something that's make-belief in, in my mind. That, that's what God has done. And, and I, want you, I want you to listen to more of what God has to say. I want you to go to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. We've been here a bunch of times. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. This is before Jesus ascended into heaven. Some of the last words that He said to His apostles. In verse 16, listen to what He says. He who has believed, He's talking about past tense, He who has believed, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now back in chapter 3, God connects belief and obedience. In, in chapter 16 of, of Mark, He connects belief with baptism. There it is, right in front of us. Lord, in, increase my faith. Jesus said, you're the one in control of that. You're, you're the one who makes, makes that call. It's not something God just gives to you. It's a choice that you make. And, and you make it by being obedient to God. That's what, that's what God was saying when, when He was, was talking to the apostles before they asked the question, Lord, increase our faith. He's talking to them about 
obeying God and, and following God and, and, and trusting God and, and doing what our, our responsibility before God is. And in doing those things, our faith will grow. We'll look back and say, wow, I, I, you know, I, I struggled with this back, back there, but I'm, I, it's not such a struggle now. We, we, we increase our faith by being obedient to God. He who believes in the name of the Son of God has eternal life. He who does not obey does not. You see how God puts them together? That's, that's not me putting it together. Now, sometimes I do put things together. Maybe I shouldn't. Go with me to John chapter 20, the very end of the Gospel of John. John chapter 20. You still may be struggling, saying, I, I just wish my faith was, w- w- was greater. Maybe you're saying, maybe you're feeling what the apostles felt when Jesus tells them, forgive your brother if he sins against you. Don't, don't cause a child to stumble. Oh, th- th- those are serious things. But listen to what Jesus says in, in John chapter 20 and verse 30. He says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. He said, that's, that's every, everything God has done. Everything God has done has been for our salvation, has been so that we'll believe. Every every sign that that Jesus performed, every miracle, every time He healed the blind and and gave hearing to the deaf and and the ability to speak to those who were dumb, every time Jesus healed those who were were, were lame and, and gave life back to those who had died, every time Jesus did everything He did, it was so that we would believe So that we believe. And it's looking at what Jesus has said. It's listening to what Jesus has said. It's meditating upon what Jesus has said. That that will be the origin of our faith. And and that's how we we increase our faith. By, By spending more time in God's Word. By spending more time checking ourselves and making sure that we're walking in the light. Increase our faith. Oh, you're in the driver's seat on that one. You're in the driver's seat on that one. We, we can talk about it, but remember, everything God has done is so that we'll believe. Increase our faith, Lord. Strengthen our faith. The question really needs to be, not, not putting the, the, the onus on God, but leaving it where it really is, on, on us. What are we doing with our faith? Are you using what faith God has given you? Are you, are, you, are you trying hard to follow His will? Don't, don't, don't put it off on God. Because we have everything that we need right here. God tells us, and again, in, in, in what Peter is saying, we have everything that we need right here in the pages of God's Word to, to help us live life as a Christian. Everything that we need is right here. Everything that we need to help us forgive our brother if we follow these instructions and everything that we need to help us to obey God in all of His commandments. So it's not, Lord, increase my faith or it's not, Lord, strengthen my faith. The the question really needs to be directed at each one of us as individuals. Uh, uh, To me, for myself, and to you for yourselves. Are we using our faith to follow God? And if you're not, it would be your choice as to whether that changes or not. And if there's any way that we can help you, working together, pleasing God, come right now while we stand and sing.